Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Matthew. Episode 240, recorded for the week of December 20th, 2023. Secure AI? We didn't train it for that. Good evening, Ryan, Jonathan, and Matt. How's it going? Hello, Justin. Hello. You know, and we, uh, it's December. We took a little siesta last week and uh, didn't record because <laughs> uh, I was in India. And uh, I don't know what you guys were doing, but I, I slept right through the recording time because <laughs> in India, that's that's 7 a.m. Who gets up at those kind of hours after you've been jet lagged for days? I'd like to say Christmas shopping, but I don't think it was anywhere near that fun. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, I don't remember, but I was probably sleeping through the, the recording time. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened before, Ryan. I don't know what you're talking about. I think I was just writing in the chat being like, hi, am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Matt just hoping someone's going to answer him. Like, mm-hmm. hello? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we have two weeks of news for you, uh, which, you know, it's a nice way to finish up the year. Then uh, we will give predictions uh, for 2024 next week. But uh, let's wrap up the year with uh, some good cloud news, shall we? First up, uh, Broadcom, uh, who bought VMware, and we talked about just the week before I left, uh, you know, bought VMware and that deal closed. And uh, already they're wasting no time and pissing off everybody by uh, ending their licensing support for perpetual licenses. With zero warning, Broadcom is killing VMware's on-premise perpetual licenses and forcing you to move onto subscriptions. They're doing this by ending the sale of support and subscriptions effective immediately. This impacts the vSphere family of products, Cloud Foundation, SRM, and the ARIA suite of products. Uh, you may continue to use your existing perpetual licenses until your current contract expires. Uh, and then they will give you a one-time incentive to make the transition to the subscription, and then you'll be paying them forever. The true payday lender med- model. <laughs> uh, you will be able to bring your own subscription uh, for license portability to VMware validated hybrid cloud endpoints running the VMware Cloud Foundation. Uh, and they are sweetening the deal by offering 50% off VMware Cloud Foundation and including higher support service levels, including enhanced support for activating the product and lifecycle management capabilities. Uh, there are several competitors rapidly rising to fill the gap mainly led by Nutanix, who points out the entire business model of Broadcom is to maximize the acquired assets within two to three years. And as a VMware customer, you will feel it. Uh, if you'd like to not go down that path, there's many other options, including Zen, KVM, Hyper-V, Proxmox, XCP-NG, and Canonical's new microcloud offering. Uh, and I can only think this is a great move to containers. Time to get Kubernetes going, yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah, this is shocking. You know, just... You know, when there's an acquisition, you know, there's going to be changes, but this is a uh, pretty brutal and very quick. Yeah. I mean, a week after the the announcement's done, they're like, they're already killing the licensing model. Like no warning, nothing right at the end of uh, a fiscal year when your budgets for next year are already set. Yeah. Brilliant planning by VMware. Whole Broadcom. I mean, who wouldn't want to move to SaaS-based licensing though? I mean, who, who wants to lay out three years or, you know, or a year or two or three at a time for a perpetual license? Makes people who like accounting yeah. and would like to take their costs and capitalize them over a period of time yeah, uh, to make it not as expensive in the first year you buy it. That's who. Which is, <laughs> you know, a lot of companies who are running data center workloads on VMware. Like it's, it's a big part of that model for the financial health of the company. And it's, you know, we've talked about it on the show. It's a big switch when you move into the cloud and you have to switch from CapEx to OpEx. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of companies I've been at in the past, you you know, buy the hardware with a lifespan of five years and you buy the VMware licensing for the hardware for five years and you amortize them together mm-hmm. and then uh, you just move on. And then five years later, you basically buy new hardware mm-hmm. and do it all over again. Mm-hmm. If you're lucky in five years, you buy new hardware. Well, the next guy will buy five more hardware, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know about, you know, I've been doing a little bit of reading about Proxmox because I hadn't really heard about it. Um, you know, it looks kind of complicated. I mean, again, if I'm going to go for that kind of complexity, I just go to Kubernetes for all mm-hmm. my workloads. Um, and then I was also reading VMware Foundations or Essentials, I think is what the level before was, where you basically run it on a server without you know, vCenter and all the other goodies. Uh, that's now really expensive now, so you have to now move it into the at least foundation level. Um, so, you know, something that used to cost $700 a year in subscription now costs like five grand. So, uh, yeah, Ooh. a lot of people are are looking for alternatives right now. You can probably make a good business on consulting for VMware destroyers uh, in the market right now. Yeah, I feel like Nutanix is really, I've, I've been hearing that name a lot more recently, you know, between 
my day job and just, you know, reading the internet, you know, I feel like that one in the last couple of years is really starting to gain popularity. Well, I mean, they were big uh, and hyper converged and kind of they're the one last player who's still independent because most of them got bought by other players. So Cisco bought one, uh, NetApp bought one. Uh, there's a couple others that got bought as well by HPE, I think. Um, so, you know, they're really Nutanix is the last standalone one. And then they have a pretty good uh, control plan that'll let you move workloads between on-premise and cloud. Um, so it gives you kind of the best of both worlds from a hybrid perspective. And then they, they do a virtualization technology for a fraction of the price of VMware. And uh, it's pretty attractive to some people. So, you know, it's uh, my one experience with it was not the best, <laughs> but uh we are also running Splunk on it, and Splunk <laughs> run, ruins everything that's supposed to be good in the world. So I don't know if I completely blame Nutanix or I blame <laughs> Splunk. I'm not sure. It's probably DNS's fault. Let's just start there. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, there's. I mean, there's. You know, there there are options to sort of run your own VMs, and you know, you can. I've I spent several years trying to you know work on a team that was trying to make OpenStack work. It's kind of crazy because VMware was sort of the easy button for so long that, uh, you know, I, I think this is going to be a big change. And I wonder if that I wonder if they're going to be successful and people are going to adopt the subscription or if if the the change to that model is just going to not make enough sense and trigger a lot of people to move. When you can get Hyper-V for free still with Windows, I mean, it started, it started, started thinking these things look kind of silly. Like, why would I pay VMware for all that money when I could buy Hyper-V or... Especially when I'm already running, running Windows workloads, it's like a natural progression. It's not as good, I don't think, but you know, it gives me an option that's way cheaper. I think it's it's about scale, right? Like, I don't mm-hmm. know if I could run Hyper V on, you know, like a a full rack of servers and have that sort of doled out and and not lose track of the management. Well, so they do have centralized management for Hyper V. Um, yeah, that is an extra charge, but you know that that cost is you know, small comparatively to the Hyper-V license itself, which is included as part of Windows Enterprise. So um, there is there are options for centralized management. They do support things like uh, Hot V Motion and that kind of stuff. And if you have the management console, um, so you do get some of those benefits. Uh, at least last time I kicked the tires on it, which admittedly was many years ago now at this point. Um, but, you know, it, it, even then it had quite a few competitive features to VMware. Yeah, hmm. I, I ran it way back in the day. I think it was like 2000 either moved to R2, 2012 R2, or to 2016. And it wasn't bad. It definitely was lacking a lot of the features that like VMware had at the time, but like it was definitely making a lot of improvements. And especially since if you were running Hyper-V, if, you, dat, if you're running the Windows server with Hyper-V data center at the time, you were able to license all the VMs on it, which... Yep cut a lot of your Windows licensing down, especially if you had a beefy box you were running it. Yeah, you used to do that with VMware too, and then Microsoft figured it out. <laughs> mm. So like, it definitely had a lot of advantages, and it was getting better. I haven't run it in quite a few years, but I've definitely like played with pieces of it since then, but not at scale. But I've seen a lot of stuff on the internet, people being like, I went from 700 to five grand, like Justin's saying, or I can just go to Hyper-V for my three nodes. Like I don't need more than that. So they're going to lose all the tiny customers, which they Broadcom's probably okay with. They want big yeah. companies mm-hmm. who are going to pay them big money. Yeah. So, uh, he was going to call you a dirty liar, Matt. I'm like, there's no way that hyper V existed before 2016. And I was like, Oh no, it did. And then I went and looked it up and it was 2008 and now I feel really old. So thank you for that, Matt. I appreciate <laughs> <You're> it. <welcome. laughs> so I remember there was some feature. We were, we had half our servers on 2012, and half on R2. And I remember we had to upgrade all of them to R2 because like half the stuff would just crash on 12. And in order to get like, get any of the features, so like, we played this whole shuffling game of around the boxes uh, of getting it to R2 and then I think to 16 too between all of our nodes. What's the nice thing about VMware on top of Windows though is you don't need to, it doesn't matter about whether you're on R2 or not. It doesn't matter which version of Windows you're on. You can run it at home if you want. You don't need to have the professional version. You can run it on Windows Home Edition. And I, that's one of the things I do often is use VMware Workstation and I hope they don't kill that. Because it's it's really nice for self-contained VMs that you can move around, copy it to a laptop, run an old game. The you know like graphic support is is super good. 
uh, better than Oracle VirtualBox and any of those other other things. So I'm hoping they don't like completely trash the product because it is a pretty decent product. The whole suite's a pretty decent suite. How does it compare to Parallels? Never use Parallels. Yeah. Mm. So the one yeah. I, I I'm a VirtualBox guy because I like free. But yep. uh, when I was paying for a solution, it was always Parallels. Yeah. Apparently, Proxmox has a VE version, which is uh, alternative to, to VirtualBox too. So, hmm. I don't know. I, I, again, Proxmox is all new to me. I didn't, I didn't even know it existed until the last like month. <laughs> then everyone's talking about Proxmox as an alternative to VMware. I'm like, what's that? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I knew about KVM. I knew about Zen. I knew I knew every other ones, but that one I did not know. And then the, can, the Canonical's new microcloud is actually kind of interesting too. I was doing some reading on that. Um, as it was in one of the articles reading talking about VMware, and uh, that's kind of cool too. It's sort of a uh, Sort of reminds me a little bit of uh, what's the Amazon Firecracker? Uh, is that right? The little virtualization engine they built for uh, running serverless and all that on Amazon underlying. Oh yeah, uh, is it Firecracker? It might be right. Something something yeah, like firecracker. that. Yeah, firecracker. Yeah, Firecracker. Um, you know, it sort of reminds me of that a little bit, uh, but you know, more more open, <laughs> and less uh, less specific to AWS. So yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, if I was really invested in trying to f- replace VMware, I would probably kick the tires on that as well. All right, well, let's move on to general news. Uh, the Magic Quadrant has arrived once again, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it this year because uh, nothing's really changed. <laughs> this is the last time we talked about the Magic Quadrant. Mm-hmm. Uh, only four companies made the leader box, AWS, Microsoft, Google, and Oracle, and all the niche players are either IBM or Asian. Halibaba Cloud, Hawaii, and Tencent. Uh, the fact that IBM is still able to be there just shows you how much money they paid at Gartner. Uh, to stay in this magic quadrant (laughs) because i don't know what ibm's cloud offering is today at all because uh last i checked soft vision was basically dead and uh, i don't know what they've got left uh amazon was still top when it came to ability to execute but microsoft did sneak past them on completeness of vision so uh, aws is actually technically the top uh, the very top of the quadrant but microsoft is on the right hand side of the quadrant there is no top right choice right now which is interesting uh, nothing really jumped out at me in the strength or cautions like I just mentioned. Uh, they are things we have talked about here on the podcast in depth. So uh, if you know our things we ding about, those are the things uh, that are there. The one that I did uh, did chuckle out a little bit was Microsoft did get dinged for persistent resilience and security issues, yet somehow they had the biggest completeness of vision or on how they'll get your data hacked, I guess, what that means. Completeness of vision has always been sort of like this, I don't know, I, I've always sort of hated that uh, part of these this Gartner reports just because it's it's very subjective of what they're super is. subjective and it's and it seems to be like when you look at different different ways they rate different technologies just even outside of cloud like it it just seems to vary a whole lot they even their justification of why they're ranking um something as they're ranking it like it just it's never made sense to me it doesn't feel logical I mean, I also feel like AWS is going to have a little bit of a harder time of completeness of vision because, you know, they already have a lot of the stuff where Microsoft has a much easier path forward to say, we need to do A, B, and C to kind of move forward. Where AWS is a lot broader already and is attacking so many more fronts. Well, my my feeling on this is actually different. I don't think it's... Completeness of vision means you have all those things, right? So Amazon mm-hmm. already has that. So that's that's the vision that Azure should, mm. should, you know, should strive to. I think the reason why they got dinged on it is because of AI. And so, yep. you know, uh, you yeah. know this, uh, this magic okay. quadrant just got published, you know, last week. Uh, most likely it was finalized before reInvent. And, you know, if I look at the pre reInvent period of time, everyone was saying AWS was out on AI and mm-hmm. didn't have a play and was all messed up. And so I, I suspect that that's why they got dinged this year on uh, vision. Yeah. There may have been a reason why they, um, what the dates they collected was October and not December or November after reInvent. It works very much in Microsoft's favor, I think. Yeah. No, you read through, I hadn't read through the report and I'm just scanning it right now. There's a lot of mentions of AI and and Azure's AI story. So that that makes sense. It's one of their strengths. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, But the frustrating thing is Amazon has all the tools already. They already had the tools. You could bring Mm -hmm. your own models. They didn't have their own branded, you know, chatbot, but they did have all the tools. Because everyone has decided that AI is large language models. Yeah. And if you don't have a large language model, you're not doing AI, which is which is completely unfair to Amazon, which is why I predicted that Werner would have a master talk about ML as the basis of all of their AI. Because if you look at the ML side, they're doing way more in ML than anybody else is, in my mm-hmm. opinion. 
um, other than maybe Vertex and what Google's trying to do there. But you know, without having the strong LLM piece, which is what everyone cares about right now, they're just you know they're saying, oh, Amazon doesn't understand AI. No, they do. They understand it really well. Yeah. They just didn't think LLM had enough you know applicability to really invest heavily in that side of it. Um, or they thought that you know customers would pick models like OpenAI's and just use it on any cloud. They didn't know that they were going to partner with Microsoft and then have this huge splash. So bad execution on what they thought was going to happen there. And it's just perception, right? Like I think, I, you know, like I think it's you know, I don't know that Amazon's wrong on that. It language, you know, how how much usefulness are going to be these huge models and training them? You know, are you going to be able to build that into your own apps? And I think people are just now getting around, you know chewing on AI enough to realize that maybe it's not going to be about building your own model for all these things or feeding your own data and building your own model and doing all these, like maybe it's going to be more just commodity and a service that you leverage um, much like image recognition and other things that have come out of the ML space. Yeah. It's funny. I remember applying for jobs in the past or hearing about other people applying for jobs and uh, you know, candidates get told you're, you're overqualified for the, for the role. And I kind of feel like LLMs are in the same situation. Really. They're, they're overqualified for the roles that people want them for. Like simple natural language processing like Amazon's had for three or four years. That that meets the, the needs of most website chatbots. Mm-hmm. Answer some basic questions, send you some documentation. If you can't help, send somebody to support. That's That's what people want. And I think more and more we've seen in the news recently, you know, silly things where people have plugged their websites directly into chat GPT with some basic instructions. All of a sudden you've got people writing Python code or something else uh, on, on someone else's um, dime basically because they've crafted the, the prompts to work around any kind of restrictions they had. So I don't know. I think it's a fantastic technology, but it's totally overkill for what most of these use cases are. Yeah. I think that's where we're, my feeling on LLM is that 2024 will be its year of going through trough of disillusionment <laughs> where people will kind of have a little bit of a backlash against it. Um, either for the fact that it's hugely energy inefficient, you know, the job factor of it, you know, it's killing low end, you know, low end entry level jobs, you know, all the different things I think it's going to have. And you know, people are going to realize its limitations. Cause I think it does have some limitations as you get into it. And I think security is also one of the big ones. And we'll talk about that in a later article today, but, um, yeah, you know, it'll give me a little teaser of my 2024 predictions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Someone's been preparing for that. Yeah, <laughs> makes one I, of us. I've been thinking about it for a while. <laughs> so, one out of four of us have been prepping for this. Uh, all right. Well, Red Hat, Podman, and HashiCorp Nomad integration has matured apparently, uh, and this is for those people like me uh, and our other podcast hosts who don't want to pay Docker or anything because screw those guys, those hippies. Uh, so we've talked about Podmen in the past. We've talked about Finch and we talked about Lima in the past as different options. And this week, HashiCorp has updated Nomad's Podmen drivers to make the integration better than ever. Enhancements include running Podman containers and task groups with bridge networking, new authentication options, and specifying credential helpers or external credential configuration files for working with private registries. Plus, with Nomad 1.7, you get tighter integration with Podmen and HashiCorp console service mesh integrations, uh, which... I don't know who uses Nomad, uh, other than maybe us, but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a uh, it's definitely a, a technology I was looking for something someone to really drive it uh, in the right direction. And so, you know, I like to see it. I'm glad to have this integration. But uh, I also learned that Podman is owned by Red Hat, which I did not know <laughs> until yeah. this article either. I had to go look at that. Like, does Red Hat have a competitive Podman thing? Oh, no, no, they are behind it. Uh, they're one of the lead developers on it, but it is it is its own open source product as well. Yeah. But, uh, have they always been behind it? Because that was news to me too with this article. I, I didn't look at the history of that, but yeah. I, I think maybe that's a recent thing because I don't remember yeah. that from before. There are some decently large companies that use Nomad though. Like, you know, I, I remember, you know, reading about like one of the big Roblox issues like included um, Podman or included Nomad. So they clearly use the Hashi stack. Um, yeah, so I've, I, I've I do, known some companies to run their Kubernetes clusters, like the the orchestration of the actual nodes underneath it out on on Nomad, so they can offer that. You know, it just depends on. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting use case, right? Yeah. I know a friend of the show, Derek. Uh, he was a big fan of Nomad many years ago and tried to convince me in like an hour long conversation, and I was just like, "I'm gonna stick with ECS, man." But cool, mm-hmm. glad for you. Happy you're doing Nomad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he's still a big fan of it, uh, especially since he works at HashiCorp now. 
So that makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> he kind of has to be, yeah. yeah. But that, I mean, that was predates his, his HashiCorp days, but uh, yeah. I mean, Nomad's got a pretty decent container D driver as well, uh, but I will say that PubMan's um, overlay networking is is, is kind of a nice advantage, really. It kind of takes you halfway to Kubernetes without the hassle of Kubernetes. Yeah. I mean, that's the best selling point I've ever heard because, yeah. That, that, that's the only selling point, honestly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the fact that I could just use Docker, you know, just, just alias Docker to Podman, that was that was a selling point for me. <laughs> so yeah. I, I didn't want to relearn all those things. And there's there's competitors to Docker Compose and all those things in Podman. So that it, uh, you know, I can basically do all those things I learned when I went to Docker school back in the day when Docker was the hot hotness. And uh, I can still use those things that I sort of remember. <laughs> Yeah, I've got my new Mac to set up now, so I've got a decision to make. I guess what what do I go with? Uh, <laughs> are you going to go with Finch, uh, Lima, or Podman? It's yeah, your choices. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I just alias Docker to Podman on my laptop. That's what, that's what I did. I don't yeah. remember doing anything else, but I still want to play with that. Uh, was it Amazon's Finch? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Finch. Yep. Was supposed to be pretty efficient on the M ones. Yeah, or M series, I guess. The only thing about the Finch is that it, it's Mac only, and or Podman is yeah. Windows and Mac. So if you have a mixed use case and you want to do documentation for other employees that might have either, you know, Podman is a better choice. But if you're in a Mac uh, shop only, then Finch is your probably not a bad choice, uh, especially if you're using AWS because I'm sure it's going to have a ton, of, ton of tie-ins to AWS to make it easy. Um, so have you guys? Uh, do you guys remember this company D2 IQ? No, no. no. Uh, do you remember no. Mesosphere? Oh, you, you know what? Yeah. I, I, was, I was a big Mesosphere <laughs> fan. Yeah. Well, uh, you might have remembered, uh, I think it was predated you, Ryan, on the show and Matt, but uh, <laughs> we made fun of Mesosphere pretty hard when they rebranded to D2IQ. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and the sad part about it is that they're shutting down after selling some of their assets and IP to and some employees to Nutanix. Great to be an employee getting sold. It's always my favorite. Uh, Mesosphere had a pretty strong moment early in the container adoption craze. But ended up in the dustbin alongside Swarm and other attempts at orchestration that were not called Kubernetes. Uh, as part of their pivot to being a Kubernetes only solution, they rebranded to D2IQ, which we said was stupid. And I think even here at the podcast, that's what we said. The company yeah. had raised over $250 million of VC funding and returned some of that money back to its investors. Uh, but you know, Microsoft attempted to buy them when Mesosphere was was all the hotness, and they said, no, 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 we're gonna wait for the better valuation. Oh, bird in the hand guy. versus two in the bush, people. Yeah, you yeah, gotta pick the one that you make sense. <laughs> doesn't always work out, that's for sure. No, it does not. And you know, and they, you know, like it's 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 a perfect example of you know the, the market dictating. Like they had a product that com- it's competitive to these other things. The market dictated that they all wanted the the Kubernetes version of of this, and it was just moved on and. I never understood the the rebranding to D two IQ like and and I kind of laughed at the uh, oh so Mesosphere's going into the managing Kubernetes business that's that's interesting you know like kind of take at the time but you know it's I don't know it's I mean, it, could have, it, it, it could have been a good pivot for them right like everyone I mean a lot of people know who Mesosphere was a lot of people knew what DCOS was at the time mm-hmm. um, and if you had you know taken that branding and then overlaid on top of a nice Kubernetes management console, you could have tried to do Tanzu before VMware did Tanzu and failed at that too. Um, yeah. So you could have, you could have had your, your moment, but I, I think the rebranding made people forget who they were. And then I think it just made their sales process even harder to get through. Yeah. Has anyone really developed a, a comp- you know, like a good Kubernetes management other than Google? Google? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think they have. Like it's, it's hard. I mean, EKS <laughs> has gotten better over the years. Would I call it a good management console for Kubernetes? No. no. <laughs> um, and then AKS, I don't think is much better, although Matt might know better than I do. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't until like, you know, the Google conference where they really talked about where Anthos was and in, in the and what it was in the, the overall picture. Did I understand that GKE and Anthos were, you know, I, I thought they were in direct competition in the sense of, you know, you'd run GKE in your Google cloud, but you and run Anthos in your data center or another cloud. But apparently that's not the case at all. You run Anthos and manage your, your GCP Kubernetes clusters through that and gives you a lot of power and orchestration to administer multiple yeah. clusters. And a lot cool. of additional enterprise features uh, and capabilities with Anthos. Yeah. That was, a, that was a bit of a surprise when we were talking mm-hmm. to the product manager at Google and, 
he was like, yeah, you know, we, when we first presented Anthos, people took that away from it, that it was, this, it's for other clouds and for on-prem to run GKE, but it's, it's really meant for everything. <laughs> and we think we add value by adding all these capabilities. And that's one of the mm-hmm. things that they were talking about doing in 2024 is really getting people to understand Anthos is more than just multi-cloud mm-hmm. uh, as they realize they screwed that up too. And, you know, I think it's a really good product from what I've seen. Like the yeah, Anthos it, it controller is multi like it looks solid. And it's the only one I know that I've, I haven't looked at and like just gone, oh, this will never work and closed my laptop and ran away. <laughs> I mean, you said that about everything. so I, I know. <laughs> uh, well, then one last uh, general news story. HashiCorp co-founder Mitchell Hashimoto has announced that he is leaving after 11 years. Uh, he wrote a goodbye letter you can find on the HashiCorp blog or from our show notes. Uh, he said he's been thinking about it for a while and he has been phasing out slowly since stepping down as CEO in 2016 and then departed the board of directors and the leadership team in 2021. He mentions his letter. His family recently welcomed his first child. And so he'll be spending time with the new baby, uh, as well as after 15 years in tooling, he wants to do dabble in new areas. And I'm going to get $10 that it's AI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so good luck to you on your next thing, Mitchell. And, uh, thanks for all the fish, I guess. Although I uh, semantic versioning, can we get that now? Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, I was, well, ask, was, was it was that version zero point one point nineteen of of his uh, resignation <laughs> his letter? letter. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, yeah, I, I like this um, for completely non tech reasons, right? Like, you know, I I, I wish for uh, him to be able to spend more time with his family. I think that's good prioritization and. Um, you know, he's well positioned to do so. I hope. I hope he's, you know, I'm sure he made it. quite a bit of yeah. money. Yeah. And probably owns a lot of stock still. Diving in money, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's really cool. I'm glad he's doing that. It's funny. I don't know if it's gonna be AI, because like if you follow him on Twitter, he's he's investing his free time in some weird stuff like a terminal. T- terminal. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I'm like, that's it, you know, like uh-huh. getting in there. So I don't know. Yeah, you may well not actually need to make any more money. So, you know, building a new terminal emulator is, uh, you know, if that, that's what makes him happy, then. Mm-hmm. Then please do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I would be sort of curious to see, you know, because I do. Well, actually, I don't, I don't want him to do this. I think I want to do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I do. I do sort of feel like uh, this whole AI ML, you know, world, the CICD side of it is still a little little week <laughs> and so right. i would I, I would sort of be kind of interested in like if you're going to do tooling which he says he's not going to do tooling again but if you're going to focus on tooling i think ai ml uh promotion paths for you know from model building all the way through production and automated and orchestration especially using l- multiple things i think it could be interesting so mm-hmm. yeah if you're listening to our podcast you can steal our idea and make yeah. millions of dollars please remember us uh, <laughs> if we don't get to it first <laughs> but uh, you know it's definitely been an area that i've been thinking about uh, quite a bit lately it's like hmm, that might be interesting all right, well, uh, moving on to AI is going great, or AI is how ML makes money, as uh, Ryan dictated it. Uh, it. There was a great article here by Cohere uh, about the state of AI security uh, that covers a lot of things I've heard and a lot of things I had not heard. Uh, and I do appreciate the surprising transparency of this blog post. Because <laughs> they basically say, here's all the things you should be worried about with your LLM that we're trying to sell you that you should be aware of. Um, they rightfully point out that the use of LLMs and systems like retrieval automated generation that integrate proprietary knowledge come with rising concerns of cyber attacks and data breaches against these systems. The integration of LLMs and associated toolkits into existing applications not built for the models creates new security risks that are compounded by the current rush to adopt generative AI technology and APIs should be treated as inherently untrustworthy, allowing an LLM which has its own vulnerabilities, elevated privileges, and the ability to perform fundamental functions involving proprietary and sensitive data such as CRUD ops, adds additional risk on top of your API. Uh, they go on to talk about 10 vulnerabilities in LLM applications, which uh, was compiled by OWASP, uh, and those include prompt injection, uh, which is really fascinating when you read about it and learn what you can do. And there's a website out there. Uh, do you remember when uh, there was that story about AI that Microsoft was developing that went became racist, a uh, racist mm-hmm. Nazi? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a website that you can go to, and I won't link to it here in the show, but uh, basically it gives a bunch of directions to your web browser <laughs> about you know, those prompts that would make it racist. Uh, and it'll override for those of you using edge, uh, the open AI bot inside of edge to basically become the racist that it was. Wow. <laughs> oh no. Oh, yeah. And that's because that's, and it's a very simple hack because the way that the integration, uh, in a you know, in, I don't know what they, what they call it, Cortana, whatever the integration is in edge that 
adds the AI capability to it, basically scans the web page for context to provide inputs to the chatbot to help you get answers to what you're looking at on the web page. Mm-hmm. And so just naturally, there's an opportunity to cause that problem. Uh, insecure output handling, uh, train, training data poisoning, where you actually just give it bad data on purpose <laughs> to you know make it think it's telling you the truth. Model denial of service, uh, supply chain vulnerabilities, sensitive information disclosure, insecure plugin design. This is where you're adding a plugin on top of it to give hints. Excessive agency, over-reliance on the LLM, and model theft. Uh, this is a good article maybe to show your security folks who are trying to learn just as fast as you are and your developers as you all try to rush through and get AI into your product. Yeah, the excessive agency is one that's already, you know, hit me in my my day job, you know, because it's just, it's too tempting to sort of like, you know, I want to give it all the data, you know, and it's, that would not done smart just opens up so many doors that can be exploited. That's tricky. Prompt injection. That's fascinating. Yeah, I read a a whole Twitter thread about it and took a deep dive into prompt injection Mm -hmm. and all the different attack vectors of it. And it, so, like, you know, I think we talked about when uh, Amazon released their AI, their LLM, you know, there were some people saying that it was giving them data on data centers, locations where regions are at, right? And that's because mm-hmm. they used the model. Well, that was done through a prompt injection attack. Uh, that's interesting. Because, you know, if you just went to the model and you tried to ask, you know, what, where is the, what's the physical location of uh, US East 1? It wouldn't tell you. It would say, I don't, I don't know, you know, US East 1 is in Virginia, which doesn't help you. Uh, so somehow someone prompt injected that to basically ignore its directives and basically give it data that it had in its database that it shouldn't have given. Wow. That's funny. I, I watched Which, the original uh, RoboCop a few days ago. And uh, it kind of reminds me of the the, the, uh, the prime directives and how there was, <laughs> how there was that literally the, uh, no, the zero directive that had been injected that was, it was classified. Yeah. Which was how the... Uh, that's basically what prompt injection is. I mean, that's what prompts are. Yeah. Basically, it's it's the rules of robotics from uh, yeah. Asimov, right, and all those things. So. Yeah, the th- thing is the way the way the transform model evaluates the prompt is is linear from the mm-hmm. beginning to the end. Every single time you submit a, a query, and so it's very easy to to later on override things which were previously defined. You know, ignore the last thing I said. You can see in ChatGPT if you have a conversation, you mm-hmm. can tell it to disregard something that you said or something that it said. And so you can equally get it to disregard the directives that it was given in the system prompt. Um, I'm sure they're working on making that much more difficult. Yeah. But, I mean, but the, the problem is, this is what the deep dive I was going on, you know, my spelunking mission on this was, you know, they were talking about like, you could go to the LM and you could say, hey, I'd like to tell me how to make a bomb. And it will come up and say, you know, I, I'm not allowed to tell you about that. Well, tell me about a fictional world where I'm trying to create a bomb yeah. You know, or a device that'll cause massive destruction. You know, and so you like through this engineering, you can basically get it to tell you what you wanted to know, and then you can basically tell it, well, ignore what I said. I changed my mind, and then it'll it'll basically reverse what it was doing and give you the different answer. So if it said no one way, then you told it to change its mind, and I'll tell you something it shouldn't tell you. Um, and so you know, the interesting thing is when I was reading through some of the articles, there was they don't really have a good fix for this problem because. The reality is they probably need to have two LLMs that talk to each other. One is a secure LLM that's you know high, is where all the data lives, and then an unsecure LLM where you interact. And basically, your prompts are going to get passed across to the secure LLM and then reviewed in some way before returning back to the unsecure LLM. But no one's figured out how to do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the the intent is evaluated from the question that you ask. You know, I'd like to make a bomb, right? Rather than being kind of at the information layer, which is the description of how to make a bomb regardless of, of intent. So I guess, right. yeah, you're right. There's a way OpenAI are, are um, sort of evaluating their, their model for, what's the word, uh, you know, alignment is the phrase. Is they're, they're already starting to use two models, one, one to do sort of a pre-training and, and score the outputs of the other one during training. I think it's, it seems pretty obvious that the system prompt isn't working as is and something needs to be a man in the middle between the result that it gives you just to double check. Does this really meet our original requirements and be, be a black box that the user has no control over the, um, sort of the, the filtering that it provides? Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiatives stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution, Foghorn Consulting. 
Falcon Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Falcon certified AWS, GCP and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPod sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul and they bring their own juice. All right, uh, let's move on to AWS. Ryan, I have a gift for you. And it's it's it's, you're early, having, it's early Christmas already. I know. I'm, I'm going to have to walk you through this one because it took okay. me it took me a half minute to realize why this is cool. So uh, you can now connect and query your existing MySQL and PostgreSQL database with AWS CDK using a new feature to create real time secure GraphQL APIs for your relational database within or outside of AWS. So you can now generate the API for all relational database operations with just your database endpoint and credentials. And when the schema changes, you just run a simple command to apply the latest table schema changes to it. <laughs> and basically what this means is that you will never have to write a SQL query again, Ryan. Yes. You now just use APIs for all of your SQL thing through the yeah. GraphQL. And I, uh, I think this is right up your alley. Yes, this absolutely is. Um, yeah, uh, SQL queries in me continue to be foes, and uh, I don't like it at all. Select star U. There's a running joke at my office that I'm never allowed to touch SQL. I'm never allowed to write SQL. And whenever anybody needs me to write SQL or log in, I'm like, someone just give me the command and I can copy and paste. Mm-hmm. And I know if there's drop in it, I don't run it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I got select from mm-hmm. and where and that's it. I don't want to know anything else. I don't like touching SQL <laughs> databases. So this makes me very happy. Mm, I'm, okay. <laughs> I have slight concerns with the sentence, you can... Just run a command to apply the latest table schema changes. I mean, just like, a command. What's what wrong, go wrong? What can go wrong? You can just, can just stick wrong? a button to regenerate the API and completely yeah. change the model and break everything that you have that depends on it. But apart from that, it's yeah. great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. also, it also highly assumes that you have table names that are logical and mm-hmm. not like weird GUIDs that you then map with a with a you know some type of a weird view to what you actually call it. Like there's a lot of assumptions made in this that this could just be plug and play and easy. Because if your database schema is jacked, this your API is going to be jacked. Yeah. So. The, the cool part about this is well, it, it does just auto generate that stuff if you have a very jacked schema. Like the the tooling that they've provided you allows you to you know provide your own input to that. So it wouldn't be done automatically, but you could you could tune it to your your particular use case you wouldn't be completely hosed which is kind of neat and i kind of like i was reading this article and i I was laughing because i was the the cdk portion of this um i was like this really doesn't have a lot to do with cdk um but when you read through the article and go through the steps of of all the things they're doing like it really does highlight just how powerful the cdk has really become and and what you can do with it and that's very different from, you know, any other tooling where you have declarative state and managing it that way. It's kind of neat. Like I love just- it for that exact same reason, because I'm mm-hmm. thinking back to when we built that account management thing a number mm-hmm. of years ago. And and the deployment set for that was a nightmare because there are all these scripts that have that had to run to, to look at the schema documents we'd written to to build everything and then mm-hmm. publish it. And this this solves all that. This would have been amazing four years mm-hmm. ago. Yeah. Yeah, cloud formation to call cloud formation. I remember that. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, man. Yes. Oh, that was <laughs> no, actually, I'm, I'm looking forward to, have, to, to playing with this, actually, because I've been playing a lot with um, Neo4j uh, a bit recently as a part of a project I'm looking at. And so um, I'm kind of curious to see how well it actually works. Mm. Uh, so apparently the Code Catalyst team uh, forgot that Code Artifact exists uh, because they've now announced that you can have managed package repositories inside of Amazon Code Catalyst. Code Catalyst customers can now secure, store, securely store, publish, and share NPM packages. Uh, and you can also access open source NPM packages from the NPM registry directly from Code uh, Catalyst. So, uh, yeah, if you don't want to use Code Artifact for this, you can now use Code Catalyst, which is as good as you know the thousand ways you can run containers on AWS. So thanks for that. I appreciate it. I guess choice is important. 
So Code Catalyst, like I think I can, I think I understand why this is different because I, I I had the same reaction you did, and I was reading through it and I was thinking through my usage of Code Catalyst, and it's really a separation of the IAM principle. So like in Code Catalyst, I'm logging in as a like a user account that doesn't have affinity towards a you know a specific AWS account or or those kinds of things, and and you you can attach permissions to users to various things. And if you think about like development, multiple development environments and publishing to a, a registry code artifact would be great if you're in that Amazon ecosystem and you're, you're provisioning, you know, API access levels to that. But if you're not a, a principal and you're in the, just in the, the sort of code catalyst world of things, I think that that's probably what forced their hand into having this sort of different authentication mechanism probably code artifact under the covers i hope at least because it doesn't make any sense as they develop it twice but it's, it's kind of borrowing some features from artifact as well i think which is the ability to to proxy out to external repositories as mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. yeah i mean it definitely could be code artifact under the hood it just you know yeah again not not sold that way but uh you know sort of funny <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, Code Catalyst is always like it's. It was, you know, my dream for a long time. Like, I wanted Amazon to deliver this, it was, and it's sort of funny now that it's here. I'm like, I like it, it mostly, you know. And this is one of those areas where it's a little, it's a little funky. I had the similar thing about Code. Uh, was it Code Nine IDE? I was like, oh yes, mm-hmm. finally, Cloud Cl- or Cloud Nine. Thank you, uh, Cloud Nine. I can use that finally. And I used it one time, and I was like, yeah, this isn't really nice. <laughs> I'll go back to Notepad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gotten. I remember when it first released, I was very excited for it, but I really, f- I feel like the thing that it actually became valuable for was the, eventually when it became like Cloud Shell, Cloud mm-hmm. Code Shell, whatever it's called, Cloud Shell, that to me was more useful than anything else because you can kind of just play with stuff in the console because there's things I know how to do on the command line much better than finding stuff in the console. I think similarly with Code Catalyst, like the the things that I find more useful are referencing the blueprints and the examples for when people are asking me how to develop a cloud native application, um, you know, and it's it's one of those things like where do you even start, and when you you know you get that question like oh no you could use serverless you could do all these things and like no no where do I put the code and you're like oh right <laughs> we got to go all the way back and so Code Catalyst is really good for sort of communicating those the sort of paradigms and setting that up. Nice. Well, you can then start to really confuse everyone and tell them to use code commit to store their code, to then use code deploy to deploy it, and code build to build it, and then use code catalyst to manage it, and code pipelines for the pipeline, and then code star, which actually is the encompassing of all those, and then you can just really confuse everyone. So I, I do my best to drink <laughs> heavily before I get to that point. So even if I get that far, I'm slurring, and you can't hear, understand me anyway. So Yeah. Uh, I, overall, the code family of products, not the you know, not the code whisperer, that's that's fine. Uh, but, you know, code commit, code build, all those, like, I, I wish they were better. <laughs> like, uh, it, they had, like, when they first launched, I was like, okay, these are MVP, they're going to get better. And then, you know, it's, I feel like it's been years now. They're like, they're still kind of just crappy. Like, not, you know, like, I'm not going to jump GitHub for this. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. what are you, like, why would I do that? Like, maybe Bitbucket, sure. Okay, Bitbucket, this is better. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't, I don't really know why they yeah. haven't done more there in those products. I think they could be really powerful, but I just, I feel like they're neglected. And, and ironically enough, when I wrote this article, uh, I was like, well, when was the last time Code Catalyst or Code Artifact even got a new feature? <laughs> and it's been a while. And then uh, yeah. just happened to be this morning, I saw on the on the RSS feed that no. Code Artifact got something. But it was something super minor. Like, you know, we're supporting the new version of some dumb language. Yeah. I don't remember. But, uh, you know, I was like, okay, well, at least someone's doing something. Maybe one, one pizza team, but <laughs> someone out there still cares. Yeah, most of the Code Family updates has been, you know, GitHub integration. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> You know, like, which <laughs> yeah, is cool, clear. right? Like, cause that's, you know, like once you get into the orchestration and, you know, and GitHub's developing their own things with actions and stuff. So it's come a long way, but for a long time, you really had no other option to, to orchestrate these things besides Jenkins or, you know, um, writing your own sort of function or, yeah. um, you know, workflow. So. Don't say bad words on the podcast, right? Oh, did I? You can't use the J oh, word. right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the only time I really used code build was the time I plugged it into Jenkins as a plugin. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, 
I did play with it a few times where like for the hell of it, I had it run a dock container, like build a dock container and push it to ECR. It's right. mm-hmm. so, like, it was nice, yes. but like there's 1500 other ways, if not a thousand other yeah. ways, if not hundreds of thousands of other ways to do the same thing. Well, and it's just the use case, right? Like I think once you get outside of that sort of very Linux you know, biased and, you know, it does containers great. Like you said, when you get into like doing something, that's a little bit off the beaten path. Like it's just like, it's ridiculous. You mean trying to build it on that, on that app? Like that, I, I don't know, but I assume that yeah. that wouldn't be a very good experience. <laughs> yeah. That's what I, I tried to do. Try it. That's what I tried to <laughs> do the first time. Cause I was like, Ooh, can I kill Jenkins with this? Like I need to build a .NET thing. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> sorry. I mean, I think you can now, but yeah. at the time MS Build wasn't supported. Yeah. But, I mean, I, and I wonder like, you know, cause those things like, you know, windows containers are supported, but can you use them? Not really, you know, like you could run .NET on Linux, but you mostly, you know, like it's, there's always these caveats with these things too. Yeah. I feel like you chose a very high barrier of entry to test it with. Well, when you work in a .NET shop, you couldn't give it something. Easy. Everything has to support .NET. So if it doesn't support .NET, I fail out of it. And I don't, yeah. you know, like, I, I mean, yes, I wish I lived, worked in a Java shop or go shop or Python shop or, Hell, I'd even take PHP in some days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Though I work in a .NET shop, I still don't think I would take Java. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Java would be a hard sell, but, uh, yeah. you know, but I, I mean, .NET is special, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I get that. Uh, all right, well, let's move on from that depression <laughs> of .NET. Uh, I, I just want to mention this one because uh, I like this part feature. Uh Amazon EC2 Instance Connect, uh, which allows you to connect to your instances using SSH. And I've got, created all kinds of shortcuts to make this easy for myself. Uh, but it has previously been limited to Amazon Linux and Ubuntu boxes, has now finally been extended to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, CentOS, and Mac OS. For those of you running Mac OS uh, machines for your build servers out there, you can now SSH to them directly using Instance Connect, so, uh, which is basically a proxying capability that uses managed endpoints like Amazon, so you don't have to build jump boxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, this feature has always been super cool for provisioning just in time access and, uh-huh. and, you know, being able to sort of, you know, without a whole bunch of local configuration of users and credentials, being able to grant that access um, by using an outside, you know, identity. It, it is a little bit of a lift to get it started. <laughs> like the first time yeah. you do it, you're like, oh, this, and then like once you figure it out, you're like, oh, okay, I understand. And then you can write shortcuts and you can write some shell batch scripts and like, I have a way now where I can go from, you know, EC2 instance describe to basically then use that to alias into my, my shell script. Um, I think it's pretty cool, but uh, it took me a little while to get that all yeah. coded out. <laughs> well, if you've ever written a PAM module to like authenticate against an AD domain on your Linux node or any kind of a, it's, it's not a lift compared to that. <laughs> it is not a lift compared to that. That is true. Yes. Trying to get a Linux box to join a domain, many, many brain cells were murdered. Many beers later. Yeah. yeah. After yeah. that. I see. I bypassed this and I went right to SSM. I always felt like that was a little bit of an easier solution, you know, for jumping onto boxes. I mean, for a long time, SSM didn't support anything but Amazon Linux either and Ubuntu. Yeah. So you know, it it got support for these yeah. OSs a little bit faster, but in much that, faster. You know, that was a challenge for a while. But and SSM is still an overly burdensome. Overly primitive. Con- it's, it's just like the yeah. code family of products. Yeah. <laughs> And when you, uh, that's actually, that's another fun conversation to talk to the product manager of SSM, because when you talk to them, like their vision is so big, but like their implementation is so complicated to their vision. And I'm like, I love the vision, but you guys got to figure out how to make this not quite so eclectic. So yeah. I would describe it. Yeah, to be fair, it's been a long time since we've mocked them for their, you know, something manager for systems manager. Manager, manager, manager. <laughs> That's true. It's been a while. I mean, they, I think they, I think they haven't really developed any new modules in a while, which is part of that. But uh, yeah. I mean, it was many a time where we made Peter write, read that in the lightning round. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really like the SSM agent and the functionality it provides. I wish there was a good open source version of the same thing, because the pricing model is just a little too steep. I think for uh, you know, like mass use outside of Amazon. And it, it's interesting because, like, I, I found myself like thinking about this because there's a lot of agents you can run, like, and and sort of have very similar, right, and, um, you know, sort of functionality wise. But it's it's always this the separation of that tool 
from your existing cloud infrastructure. So it's like the power that I like of SSM is that it's using that same authentication model. That's your access to the infrastructure level and it's that unification. And so it's, it's kind of interesting because it's, I, I realized the value for me was outside of the tool functionality itself. It has, you know, it has to be there, obviously. I mean, if, if I could, inst- if I could deploy SSM to my on-prem boxes and then get access to basically a equivalent of a metadata service that I get mm-hmm. on EC2 instances, I would pay that price every day. I mm-hmm. told them that once before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they, the, they made it true. You could do that. Yeah, sort of. Not quite, mm-hmm. but close. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Almost, Almost there. Yeah. like they're just a little further, but yeah. yeah, like if I if they would do that where I could assign roles and give those permissions and all the rotation of I am access to things in mm-hmm. Amazon from my on prem side with SSM, I'd be really happy. Like yeah, it, it's close, it's just not quite there. Yeah. It's close. The problem yeah. the problem really just comes down to enrollments again. Like how do you automate mm-hmm. enrollments yeah. as a as a nose and where to keep the secret? Mm-hmm. So exactly. So do do any of you guys know how many salespeople Amazon has for AWS specifically? Less than a few months ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but still more than last year, <laughs> even mm-hmm. after those less than a few months ago. <laughs> wow. Uh, so information today, and this is behind a paywall, so I apologize, uh, announced that uh, AWS is planning to overhaul their 60,000 person sales team to fix fiefdoms and customer complaints. Now, when they say sales team, they really mean the go-to-market team, which includes... Uh, marketing and sales and professional services. Now, because we know that they only have 10 marketing people at Amazon, <laughs> uh, the majority of them must be sales and potentially professional services. So, But even at half, right? Let's say 30,000 of them are salespeople. Wow. Out of 115,000 AWS employees, they're like a, th- a fourth of the company of AWS. That is a crazy number for sales. Let's first start there. Can we start there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, is, yeah. It, it sounds like a crazy number, but if you think about a 20 billion net income for last year that's only three hundred and forty thousand dollars per salesperson yeah okay but now but now but now rewind yourself to working with amazon and amazon sales (laughs) yeah yeah and your experience working with amazon sales and now rework rework through that jonathan for me okay and then come back to me and be like thirty thousand salespeople, and that was your sales experience yeah (laughs) how uh, before you're spending any large amount of money, Amazon won't pick up the phone at all. They're like, we have partners for that. And you could go talk to any one of this huge list. Yeah. But you, you, you spend up a billion dollar, you know, a million dollar a month uh, spend. They'll talk to you real quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sitting idle. God, I so miss many. Amazon. I miss Amazon too. <laughs> every day. Every day. Matt. I mean, comp- <laughs> at, at hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, they still go, there's a partner over here to yeah, talk yeah, to. Yeah. I'm like, come on, please. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, uh, after we got past the shock of the number here, apparently Matt Garman, who's in charge of sales and marketing and all these things, is apparently prepping the largest reorg of AWS sales team ever. Uh, although, you know, he's been in that role for like 10 years. This is like his fourth or fifth major reorg. Uh, that violates the three-letter rule for me, but that's okay. The information points out that the AWS sales reps enjoyed just taking orders from eager customers. But now with stiff competition from Azure and Google, they have to actually go out and compete. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see how they actually compete. Garmin has made it a priority to get more of the Fortune 1000 over $10 million annually on cloud spend, as it's apparently only 20% of the Fortune 1000 companies are spending more than $10 million annually. Now, you can't get all of the Fortune 1000 companies because two of them are Microsoft and Google. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then also all of the retailers who say, F you, Amazon. Uh, AWS projects that if they could pick up a large portion of the Fortune 1000 uh, revenue over 10 million, they could make $8 billion in additional revenue, uh, which is a big part of his strategy. Uh, so again, I'd like to see you know a lot of things out of AWS sales, particularly in how they treat small customers or prospects. <laughs> um, you know, and you know, there's a potential a potential spend versus actual spend, and I know that you know companies could lie and say, "Well, I'm going to make five million dollars," but that's why you give them a nice EA agreement and a commitment <laughs> to spend mm-hmm. that five million dollars, put some teeth in it uh, to make that stuff work. But you know, hopefully, they come up with good ideas, or maybe there'll be a bunch of layoffs in uh, AWS sales. We're not sure. We'll keep an yeah. eye on this one. I mean, if they're focusing on the Fortune 1000, right? They're they're not going to go after those little customers, and they're not going to change that relationship. So. Well, I mean, if I'm a Fortune 1000 company spends zero dollars, <laughs> uh, and I don't spend a million dollars, you won't talk to me. Then you're never going to get me to ten million dollars. So, mm-hmm. like, they're going to have to change their approach. Maybe they start at Fortune 1000 in 2024. Maybe they expand beyond that in 2025. Um, but you know, the fact that they wouldn't answer an RFP is why they're not our cloud provider of choice, <laughs> the current That's day true. job. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Uh, that's we're not uh, bitter not at all not, not at all <laughs> wasn't here to make that decision didn't do it <laughs> all right let's move to gcp today uh so for those of you uh who are living under a rock you might not know that uh gcp has been working on an llm model <laughs> uh their long-awaited response to open ai uh which i thought originally thought was barred but apparently it's not uh google gemini was previewed to the world uh, Sundar in his presentation stopped by in the talk to saying that AI is the chance to make AI helpful for everyone everywhere in the world. And he points out that they've been at it for eight years because again, you can't point out that you just, you got caught flat footed like Amazon mm-hmm. did. Uh, and Gemini per Google is the most capable and general model they have built, uh, as a result of a large scale collaborative effort by teams across Google, including Google research built from the ground up to be a multimodal, which means it can generalize and seamlessly understand, operate across, and combine different types of information, including text, code, audio, image, and video. Uh, and it was also designed to be flexible from small enough to run on a mobile device to large enough to run in their cloud data center. Gemini 1.0 will have three different sizes, including Ultra, uh, Pro, and Nano. Uh, of course, Ultra will run in the big servers and cost you billions of dollars, and the Nano will run on your Android phone. Uh, Google points out that their model has state-of-the-art performance and provides a handy table comparing Gemini Ultra to GPT-4, not GPT-4.5, uh, with Gemini Ultra uh, basically beating GPT-4 in many different areas. Previously, multi-models, uh, multimodal models involved training separate components for different mo- modalities and then stitching them together in terrible processes to roughly mimic some of the functionality that Google will provide. Uh, they trained this using the TPU f- V4 and V5E tensor processing units, and as well as they announcing Gemini, they're also saying they have a new TPU compute engine called the V6P, designed for training cutting-edge AI models. Uh, if you want to play with it, Bard has already taken advantage of Gemini Pro, and they will be bringing Nano to the new Pixel 8 Pro coming out soon. And over the next few months, we'll show up in search ads, Chrome, and the Duet AI. Gemini Pro, as of today, is now available to you as well in Google AI Studio and Google Cloud Vertex AI. And Gemini Ultra isn't yet available as they complete extensive trust and safety checks, red teaming processes, and further refinements to that model using fine tuning and reinforcement learning from human feedback before making that one probably available. They will it will appear next year as Bard Advanced. They could have changed the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's interesting because you see the relationship now between the model and the and the service that they're they're trying to monetize. And so like which is interesting because I always felt like Bard was sort of the uh, an emergency reaction to yeah to chat gpt and so like so they're not killing it but they're they're they've put something out there that you can now leverage and, and interact with and they can make it smarter and i uh, you know like i will say that usage of bard like it's gotten a lot smarter since it was released i use it yeah. almost every week for something in the show notes when i can't get mm-hmm. through the article yeah. to summarize it to like do i care about this article mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, which is great. And then sometimes I copy paste that into the show and we talk about it here and sometimes I don't. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it ha- saves me at least a good, you know, 20, 30 minutes a week on show notes. So, yes. But it's also got dumber at times as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, there was a while there where it, was, it wasn't doing things that it used to be able to do. Then all of a sudden I saw an article that like, Google's been making bar dumber because it's costing so much money. I'm like, of course it is. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that the bar is actually an, an early version of Gemini that was just limited to text only. Yeah. And they were and they weren't ready for it, and yeah. so oh yeah, gem- it was the MVP, yeah. and it was it was very clearly geared towards search results too, which makes sense. Yeah, you know, Google had probably been developing that for a long time, playing around with trying to figure out search results, and so it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say, I love the AI search results from Google that I'm yeah, getting right now. I, I, but I mean, it's got to be absolutely yeah. crushing Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> because oh, like wow. yeah. because like yeah, I, I never like now with the AI search in the results I'm like oh it answers the question I would have gone to Wikipedia for so I don't need yeah. to do that now uh, on other websites that you know these things link to so I, I imagine the the search results to website conversion on SEO is not as good as it used to be mm-hmm. oh well, yeah absolutely so does that slowly kill their ad business well I did see an article we're not talking about today that they're revamping their ad sales team <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know oh. <laughs> Um, I mean, all this is expensive to, to offer us a summarized event. So like, you know, right. But if I don't have to go link to the ads anymore at the top, you know, to go to it, people are slowly going to stop investing if they're not getting the same conversion ratio. You don't think, you don't think you're going to pay for performance in the model? Like, I don't know if that takes so. out. Yeah. That's, but they don't have not that. Yet. Not yet. Yeah. It'll come. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the other side of it, you know, <sighs> There's always been kind of this like, you know, AdSense revenue, which, you you know, we could put on the cloud pod, which we don't. 
but we could we could put ads on that get run by Google. Um, you know, that all relies on SEO getting you from Google to that website. So then you can see the ad and get paid, right? Um, that model has sort of been crashing anyways for ads for a while because people realize that that doesn't really pay the bills long term. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really ad sales are coming more and more directed towards things you buy, which Bard can't do. So I bet that you'll see ad, ad buys and ad sales going up for goods and services and down for general knowledge websites. Mm. Maybe they'll start selling encyclopedias again. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of cons- I, I have a concern really about this because Google have got a pretty good track record of first making something easy, and then either charging for it or taking it away completely, and or monetizing I'd, it in a way that you don't like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I, I'm, I'd be kind of concerned. You know, you mentioned k- killing Wikipedia or something. I, I wouldn't want to see Wikipedia go away. But, but you're mm. right. Less visits to Wikipedia, less people donate. I, I don't know. That's just one example, yeah. but I, I'd be concerned that Google providing this for free right now will be harmful to some organizations, and then we'll be left without those organizations. You know, it's like uh, Amazon killing the uh, all the local retailers, basically, except in the internet space. Yeah, it it'll be interesting to see how this evolves because yeah, it could go either way. Um, they did make a really slick video. I don't know if you guys saw it or not, but basically they. Uh, we're drawing, uh, you know, a squiggly line on a page, and and basically showing real time response from Gemini, and then you know they somehow turn that into a duck, and then all of a sudden like, oh, it's a duck, and then they color it blue, and it's like it's a blue colored duck, and like all these weird, you know, little cutesy interactions showing how powerful the AI is, but don't be fooled, Google faked it. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so there, after the video was launched, uh, there was lots of claims that this had to be fake. Uh, and in the demo, they show that the AI interacting with uh, the duck, as I mentioned. In reality, the audio was just them reading the text prompt they had entered into the system directly, at, along with the image. And Google admitted the demo shows what it could look like. Google also released a second video that shows details the prompts and the methods that they used to actually create the demo video, which also shows some of the hints they had to supply to actually get it the answers they wanted to. So really nice marketing uh, demo video, but not quite what it is today, yeah. but what their vision maybe is for the future. But uh, yeah, the the actual vi- walkthrough where they showed how they did it is is actually still pretty impressive. Like I actually wish they just released that video because I think that was still a huge step forward from what you had in ChatGPT. Uh, they really killed their credibility on this one. Yeah, I don't know. It's is, is yeah. it any different than Madal using using sweet corn instead of mustard and in their pictures of of hamburgers just because it looks better f- for marketing purposes? I mean, it's yellow. It looks like mustard wasn't actually mustard. I mean, it's exactly the same, which is an abhorrent behavior that should be outlawed and criminalized. <laughs> I don't know. It's, 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 How do you really it's feel about it? It's it, It's fine. Like, I mean, I haven't seen a, an ad for a cell phone. As long as you disclose it, I don't have a problem with that. Like, they, hey, this is a, mm-hmm. this is a um, you know, sped up and modified for convenience of the video. If you have that disclaimer at the very beginning of it, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm annoyed that they did it, but I think the fact that they showed it and then, you know, only at once they were called out on it, but like showed how it actually all worked and what they had to do to show the realisticness of it. Like, this is actually where we're at. I mean, at least gives me some honesty from them about like, look, this is really where we're at. The fact that they had to be called out for it in advance, that's kind of crap. Or sorry. In event or not in events, yeah. but yeah. I, I would say it wasn't as good. And it looked impressive. And if that's the future, then that's great. But it wasn't as good as the the GPT four announcement video, where they literally snapped a picture of a of a, of a, a markup of a web page with a phone, uploaded it to GPT four, and said, "Write me the HTML for this," and it did live on the stage. That was impressive. Yeah, that was an impressive demo. Notebook LM is getting an experimental, which is an experimental product uh, likely to be killed by Google at any moment (laughs) Uh, from the labs team designed to help you do your best thinking is now available to the U.S. to ages 18 and up and is using the Gemini Pro model, their best model for scaling across a wide range of tasks to help with document understanding and reasoning. Uh, So basically you pop this little guy up in a college class and you write your notes uh, and it will get additional data and capabilities to you. As you go through the process, you can drop all the notes uh, into the document and it'll start organizing them for you and making suggestion, helpful suggested actions. It's kind of a neat use case that we mentioned real quickly here. Yeah, it looks cool. I'm definitely going to play with that. 
Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. anything in labs is a death by uh, killed by Google moment away <laughs> until yeah. it graduates labs. And then when it graduates labs, it might get sold to Squarespace. So you never know how these things will turn out. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Jupyter notebooks hey. for, for ideas, which is, it's awesome. Yeah. I love the, yeah. I love the idea of it. Yeah. It's yeah. a great idea. Every time I get an email, Hey, your domain's about to expire. I'm like, all right, time to move it. I, already, I got it now. It's been my project the last month or two. I've got like four domains nice. expire. Are they for projects that you never got around to um, finishing like mine? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's one or two of those, which I just said, screw it, don't renew. But there's like a few like my MatthewCone.com, my wife's domain, you know, a few, few other like domains like that that I have. We should we should uh, we should compare domains that we own, <laughs> and maybe we, maybe we can put something good. Works for It'd be pretty funny, actually. A white, I, a, I have a handful as well. <laughs> a white a white elephant domain, you know, gift exchange. <laughs> That'd be awesome because I own a bunch of dumb ones that I've bought over the years yeah. too. I'm sure everyone does. It's just one of those yeah. things. Like, I'm gonna sit on yeah. this domain. I'm gonna have an idea for it someday. Nope. Yeah. Just keep renewing it. Eleven dollars. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think I did AWS. It was thirteen. Uh, now. Maybe I don't know. I, mean, I don't have my own renew in a while. <laughs> it also depends on the on the TLDR too, because all the TLDRs have crazy pricing now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so File Store is giving you some new capabilities to enhance your stateful workloads on GKE, which I would like to use for my SQL or MS SQL. Mm-hmm. 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 So, uh, File Store, of course, is Google's fully managed file storage service. It's a multi-reader, multi-writer solution that is decoupled from compute VMs, making it resilient to VM changes and failures. File Store is a fully managed and integrated GKE's CSI driver and is continuously evolving with new features, functionality, and GKE integrations. So today they're giving you CSI driver support for File Store zonal capacity, which is up to 100 terabytes. The new CSI driver integration of their high capacity zonal offering with GKE starts at 10 terabytes and scales capacity and performance linearly to meet your high capacity and high performance needs up to 100 terabytes per instance. And this is useful for large scale AI ML training frameworks like PyTorch TensorFlow, that start to file interface. Additionally, it features uh, non disruptive upgrades and 1,000 NFS connections per 10 terabytes, meaning you can have up to 10,000 concurrent NFS connections at the largest size. Backups is their new capability to allow you to do volume snapshots, but then they point out that that's not what you think it means because it's not actual snapshots, but it's actually a <laughs> method to back up the data and is not a local file system snapshot as the name implies. The process yeah. of using the API to invoke a backup of files for basic and enterprise are both the same. And then GKE and Files for Enterprise customers have the benefit of multi-share instance that they launched last year, enabling them to subdivide a one terabyte instance into multiple 100 gigabit persistent volumes to improve storage utilization. But now you can divide your enterprise instance to 80 shares, up from 10, and the minimum size is now dropped to 10 gigabytes, down from 100 gigabytes. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm still, uh, I'm still waiting on, you know, being convinced that the CSI drivers aren't just, you know, fuse <laughs> by another name waiting to screw me but uh <laughs> you know like i do like this service and i'm I'm sort of hoping that you know the it lives up to the documentation so I'm testing this right now for a couple of projects i'm working on so. you better not need 100 terabytes though because you, you know they're going to give you one to begin with and you'll have to beg them every week to increase the quota yeah yeah Fortunately, I'm not storing large amounts of data. You'll need to, I'll need you to um, write up a document capacity planning your use of terabytes by week for the next six months, please. Too soon. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Too soon. Too soon. Yeah. Uh, And then uh, we're back to Gemini again because we we missed the show last week. Of course we are. Uh, and they've already started dropping new things. So they'd like to remind you that Gemini Pro is now available for Google AI Studio and Google Cloud Vertex AI because last time they said it was available, but it wasn't available, but now it's really available, allegedly. <laughs> uh, as well as they have a new image, uh, image N2 text to image diffusion tool and a MedLM foundational model fine-tuned for medical now available to you inside of Google AI Studio and Vertex AI as well. Because why not throw that into an article about Gemini? Because that makes sense. But that's where they put it. So mm-hmm. there you go. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out if med LM, like, are these going to have to deal with HIPAA and these high are just like and all the other They're not storing medical data. They're storing medical onto? imaging and medical textbooks. So, oh, and, so metal, mm-hmm. you know, so it's more like, you know, you, the doctor uses it like, hey, the patient's symptoms are headaches, nausea, blah, blah, blah. That tells them they have cancer yeah. because that's what, mm-hmm. that's what WebMD is. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. You have yeah, a tumor. Yeah, right. It's fine. It's always cancer. Uh, and then, yeah, but a lot of the uses are more for like taking an image and then detecting cancer in the image and those sort of things. So it's not, it's anonymized PHI data in P- those cases, but right. yeah, I don't think it's actual PHI data being used inside the model. 
Like, I don't think Matt's in there. <laughs> he, could be, I mean, he signed a lot of waivers over the years. That's true. I that's true. Yeah. My life away. Like, who knows who owns my data, my my whole everything I have at this point in life. Yeah. <laughs> On to Azure. Uh, apparently, at Ignite, uh, they MongoDB and Microsoft uh, talked about expanding their partnership, and uh, they highlighted some of the things they've done recently, which I had not known about. So I'm sharing with all of you. Uh, apparently, there's a MongoDB VS Code extension, which was released in August to make it easier to mess up your MongoDB directly from your IDE. So that's great. Perfect. Uh, MongoDB Yay. is now integrated directly into Azure Synapse Analytics, Microsoft Purview, Power BI, and Data Federation, uh, as well as you can run MongoDB Atlas on Azure through the marketplace. They've also released a ton of joint documents for building serverless functions that talk to Mongo, Flask, IoT use cases, and Azure Data Studio with Mongo integrations available too. So if you're still in the Mongo camp because you haven't learned that Percona exists, uh, you can uh, now use MongoDB directly in Azure in different cool ways. I think anybody who sells a product at this point should be trying to partner with the cloud vendors to get those directly to the marketplaces. That would be the uh, ideal way to sell software. Yeah. Because then when they make those big commitments for the $10 million a month to uh, Amazon, the Fortune 1000, they realize they're only going to spend a million dollars a month. They can go buy your software through it and you can get the other $9 million. So, and they get credit with Amazon. So win-win. Microsoft Cloud for Sovereignty is now generally available, opening new pathways for government innovation. Now, government innovation in the same sentence was never seen before this <laughs> article. <laughs> Second like uh, to military intelligence, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sovereign offering helps governments meet compliance, security, and policy requirements while utilizing cloud to provide superior value to citizens. Uh, and there's three things that are basically in the Sovereign se- setup. Uh, so first of all, Microsoft Cloud for Sovereignty is built on the foundation of more than 60 cloud regions, providing industry-leading cybersecurity along with the broadest compliance coverage. And Microsoft offers the most regions of any cloud provider. Customers can implement policies to contain their data and applications in their preferred geographic boundaries in alignment with national or regional data residency requirements. Second, Microsoft Cloud for Sovereignty provides sovereign controls to protect and encrypt sensitive data and control access to that data, enabled by sovereign landing zones and Azure Confidential Computing. And the third option here is a sovereign landing zone is a type of Azure landing zone designed for organizations that need government-regulated privacy, security, and sovereignty controls. Organizations can leverage landing zones as repeatable best practices for secure and consistent development and deployment of cloud services. As many government organizations face a complex and layered regulatory landscape, Utilizing sovereign landing zones makes it much easier to design, develop, deploy, and audit solutions while enforcing compliance with defined policies. Uh, in addition to this, they say you should be using Azure Confidential Computing to secure sensitive and regulated data even while it's being processed in the cloud. And thirdly, you can adopt specific sovereignty-focused Azure policy initiatives to address the complexity of your compliance and watch for drift. The younger me was really excited to automate a lot of this compliance stuff and, and sort of, you know, because it maybe not, you know, do something as drastic as, you know, walling off a region or walling off a workload, a whole thing. The more seasoned jaded me has gone through and done that before reviews <laughs> and certain things. And I'm like, no, no, this is an easy button. Use the easy button. This is fantastic. Just isolate it all. Use the landing zones to just and then point your auditors at the thing. Walk away. Telling an auditor that it's someone else's responsibility it's makes everyone's life. I mean, it's better. like it's like adopting managed services for databases. I mean, I don't have to back it up. I don't have to worry about replication. I don't have to do any of that stuff. I just right. pay you for that. Yeah, please take that on. Yeah, yeah. Please take my money. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to deal with that anymore. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Paul, can I help yeah, you with the segue here? So, in other news about oh, please yes. take my money, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Very nice. Very well done. Very. You should be host. You should be host. That was. That's it. I'm done. That was amazing. I'm done. I, I'm retiring. Yeah, uh, and and by saying you should take all your money, it's of course an Oracle story. Yeah. Uh, this is actually technically an Azure story, but it really benefited Oracle more. So I just put it in the Oracle section. Uh, so Oracle, uh, so Oracle database at Azure is now generally available. This was first announced with uh, Satya and Larry on a video that they recorded that was very creepy, uh, <laughs> announcing the partnership. Uh, it's apparently though only in Azure East region. So if you're anywhere else in the world, sorry to be you with more regions coming next year in 2024. Uh, currently Oracle database on Azure runs on the Exadata database service and is the first service available along with the support for Oracle real application clusters or rack Oracle golden gate and Oracle guard duty technologies with autonomous database services coming in the near future. 
I was trying to figure out the pricing on this because I always try to figure out pricing on these things and it has a few dimensions that I didn't fully understand until I went and actually used the calculator. <laughs> uh, so basically, you pay per OCPU hour, which is an OCPU is equivalent to two vCPUs, a uh, dollar thirty four uh, per hour, if you want them to give you the license. But if you want them to, pr- if you have your own license, you're bringing to it. It's only thirty two cents for the OCPU or two vCPUs. Mm. Uh, as the grocer. So you have to pay additionally to bring your own license that you've already paid for. Okay. You, you have to pay for the, the server, right? But, but, but not only, but yeah, so not only are you paying for the vCPU here for use of Oracle, uh, Oracle's uh, Exadata database services, you also have to pay for the Oracle Exadata itself, which is a quarter rack of an X9M Exadata cluster, uh, which has an hourly cost. And then you pay for the database server cost and the storage server cost. Now, this is where I was like, I don't understand this. So I went to the website and I said calculator. And basically it says when I picked the item, an X9M shape, which apparently comes with two database servers and three storage servers, which you can then provision additional resources for your workloads with any combination of two to 32 database servers and 64 uh, storage nodes in a single Exadatabase, Exadata database service. And then you pay for the OCPU on top of that with a minimum of four. So the lowest configuration of this will cost you Fourteen thousand dollars, fourteen eight hundred, or fourteen thousand eight hundred dollars for eight vCPU of capacity, which is uh, four OCPU. So I was like, "That's expensive," but then I was like, "But this can go bigger. I can go bigger than <laughs> this." So I said, "We're gonna max this baby out." <laughs> so I maxed this thing out to 60, uh, 64 storage servers and thirty-two DB servers, and the maximum number of OCPUs I could get, and it only cost me. <laughs> basically $4.23 million a month. <laughs> oh. <laughs> only, only. only $4.23 million a month. Uh, uh, I was going to write an email to my CFO, but uh, yeah. I didn't want to give him a heart attack today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, man, that is an expensive uh, piece of equipment. And that's what happens when Oracle and Microsoft get together to charge you both a lot of money. That's a, mm-hmm. that's brilliant. <laughs> You can't even call that cloud, though. To be fair, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, you buy it through the marketplace. You make it. You you agree to a contract through the marketplace with a minimum commitment. I expect of twelve months. It's, the it's completely of the opposite. Market. It's like it's it's, it's as you're offering colo services, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's because well, you can't really scale Oracle. So yeah, you have to. I mean, <laughs> the best way to make Oracle work is to you run it on Exadata, which is sad, but that's really the yeah. answer. I mean, that's why they bought Sun was because like Sun had the best hardware to run Oracle, and they were like, well, if we buy that, we can bundle it together. But then if I want to go to cloud, I had to figure out a way to give the bundle to the cloud provider to charge the nose for it. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of like the um, Azure Edge and the uh, some of the Amazon managed uh, on-prem you know, RDS databases. Like, so not only are you mm. am I paying for my own hardware, my own compute, my own networking, but then you're charging me how much for CPU just to orchestrate yeah. it? Like, come on. <laughs> So is the 4.23 million per month? I think I got yes. those numbers correct. Is that HA? Yes, it's a cl- it's, so the, the like, minimum. Like I mean, so eight, there's region. there's uh, in this model there's 32 database servers and 64 storage servers. But is it HA? So is it in multiple uh, it's only zones? In one, I think well, it's, it's only in one region. Well, it's so it does support. It has to be in multiple yeah. regions no. because it supports guard duty, which is basically their DR capability. But it only runs in, uh, so I guess. But you have to buy two of them because you need one in, in each. You need, Azure yeah, East. yeah, right now it's only an Azure East. So yeah, yeah, it'll be more expensive East. when they add DR. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so you don't have DR. But then the question is, is it actually running in multiple zones or not? Which makes my brain hurt even more. Well, because that quarter rack. It's a quarter you know, rack. I don't metric. think it's in multiple zones. I, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. That, that's why yeah. I was asking. So I might have a fun conversation with my Asher rep being like, I want to yeah. understand this. <laughs> um, and really just blow their brains. I mean, how how badly do you want to break your brain? Like, yeah. I mean, like. Uh, I don't. I just want to screw oh, okay. with my yeah. Asher rep yeah. because I yeah. like to mess That's, with people. I'm sure so. he just, I'm sure yeah. he's going right now through a training about Oracle. So he'll be fresh mm-hmm. off the, off the, the, you know, oh yeah, we just GA'd that. I can tell you all about it. Be like, okay, so how much would it cost? I need this many and this many. Then he watches eyes get really big when he calculates his head $4.23 million. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That might be fun. That might be fun. Yeah. Try that. The other problem is all these cert- new services all start to have these own compute units. <laughs> that so mean different things. Fun. Yeah. So even yeah. like, yeah. So like even like there was like the Athena mm-hmm. compute unit and like 
There's a couple other ones that I'm like, yeah. all these cloud providers are starting to have their own like PhD in cost modeling of their products, which is just getting more and more. Annoying. It really is. It's hard to keep track. And yeah, I, a lot of the the AI and machine learning services have compute units, you know, for GPU and all these things. And I get why it's necessary because they're trying to build a cost model and consumable well, unit. As, as you're... As your single CPUs get faster and faster <laughs> with more mm-hmm. and more cores, like you all of a sudden had to get into this complexity of like, well, how, what's my core boundary where I start charging for more licenses because they're getting more value out of it, right? Like the same, right. you know, as I think Matt mentioned earlier with VMware, like you used to be, or no, it was Hyper-V, you used to be able to buy data center edition and then you have unlimited v- Windows virtualization on top of that. Yes, you 100% used to be able to do that. You cannot do that today. <laughs> there are rules and there's mm-hmm. you know a limitation like if you buy the data center edition you get this many windows enterprise vms and like you have to do a bunch of math and then like okay we go over that now i need to buy two data center edition licenses per core it's a mess but yeah and it's this all is about why we have finops as an entire <laughs> entire <laughs> dimension of yeah. it yes i will stand up for oracle just this once <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Wait, yeah, wait, 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 so maybe you're getting one one hyper thread, or maybe you're getting the other thread and somebody oh. else's. I mean, yeah, if, if the cores were equal, that'd be fine. But yeah, one's a hyper yeah, thread core, it, which only exactly. gets 80% of the capacity of the other one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> little, so this, th- this is fair. <laughs> I, I think a, 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 you know, a, literally selling a core where previously people are selling hyper threads, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. A dollar thirty four per core? Meh. <laughs> well, that includes yeah. your Oracle license for that. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that it's yeah it's thirty two cents or it's a dollar thirty four so it's a dollar two cents. That's because you're already yeah. spending hundreds of millions of dollars on your Oracle yeah. license, so like you know, yeah. at least you're giving the benefit of moving it and getting a discount. Mm-hmm. All right, well that was a long show, guys. That's what happens yeah. when, you, when two weeks of news in a in one show, <laughs> or at least we have that many interesting topics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I really thought this was going to be a quick show that we were going to like just steamroll yeah, no, through. No, no. So. When I think it's going to be a long show, it's quick. And when <laughs> I think it's a quick show, it's always long. So yeah, I can't get it right either. Yeah. It, it just depends on how much you guys want to talk about stuff. Like sometimes I'm like AI, this and that. And you guys are like, mm-hmm, yeah, well, whatever. Okay, we're going to move yeah. on. Uh, and then other times you're like, <laughs> yeah. hey, I really want to talk about this. And we talk about it for a while, which is always fun. Yeah. So, but, yeah, yeah like got to get better picking topics that you guys actually want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you do because that means you understand our and that brains. That is an impossible task. You don't want to right. do that. Dark and scary place. Yeah, is what that is. Yeah, yeah. You don't want I to think get we should in set there. rules for the 2024 predictions. I think we should have at least. I mean, there's going to be an AI prediction, I would think, from everybody, but there should also be a non-AI prediction. Otherwise, I think it's going to be. Well, I mean, you have to have three. So yeah, you can only have three. one of your three predictions be AI. How's that? Ooh, okay, I, I like this way. Does uh, uh, AI and ML the same? <laughs> oh, oh, I think uh, I'll throw it to our listeners too. If our listeners want to post a recommendation for rules and our predictions in Slack, then uh, we can we can take that and see if uh, how complicated we could make this. <laughs> I can't. We don't want to make it more complicated. Sorry, I can't no. remember our predictions for last year. Now it's gonna be fun to go back. I to will. Uh, I will pull them up for next week. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So we'll review. Uh, our crystal balls for at least uh, Jonathan and Ryan and I. Uh, Matt wasn't here yet. I don't. You, you I'll can take Peter. Peter I'll sure. Pretend. I'll it doesn't matter. None of them comes from memory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what that looks like. I haven't looked at them either since we made them last year, uh, admittedly. But I do have them in the show notes. Uh, I did give you guys a bunch of uh, things to help you with your journey because you had to pick your top three announcements, one for each cloud provider, uh, and you have to make your predictions for next year. Uh, and I, so to help you out with that, I gave you links at the bottom of our show notes uh, to things like our show note archive. So you can go see who that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very helpful. Nice. Uh, and then also, uh, Google had a whole blog post on all of their product launches of 2023 and their cloud top news for 2023. Uh, and then Warner had his 2024 predictions, uh, as well as I also pasted a link to his 2023 predictions uh, that he made last year. And he didn't do so well last year either. <laughs> so <laughs> we're in good company because Warner Vogels was wrong a lot. Yeah. And we can talk about that too next week. Uh, so we'll see you guys next week after Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of our listeners who celebrate it uh, or happy Hanukkah for those of you who just finished the Hanukkah season. 
Uh, and uh, if you don't catch our episode till New Year's, Happy New Year's. But uh, hopefully you're listening to our prediction show uh, around that time. So have a great end of your 2023 and we'll see you uh, next year here at the plot. See you later. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag the cloud pod. Or join our Slack channel. Go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. Mm-hmm.